team covering the Vale of Glamorgan, who's going to talk about nausea and vomiting. And then we're going to hand over to Catriona Seed, who's one of the CNSs at City Hospice, who's going to talk about pain control. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to monitor the chat. So very happy for you to ask questions in the chat or to make comments. And um, we'll we'll sort of decide when when might be a good time to ask the questions. We might leave it to the end or I might bring them in as we go through if it seems like an appropriate time. So so feel free to put things in the chat and try and interact with us because it's a bit tricky, isn't it, on a Teams call? Um, and then I'm just going to ask Charlotte from Cardiff Uni if she wants to try and run our polls, which is just going to ask people what setting they're working in and what their current role is. So if people could just tick on the box for us, if that's OK. And submit, you have to scroll down to submit at the bottom. Can you see the, re the results, Jo? I can. That's great. Thank you. So at the moment, um, I have got, oh, I can't see the number of responses, um, but I have got sort of 30 odd percent from palliative care, 30 odd percent from nursing, 11 percent doctors and 11 percent district nurses and 11 percent from the ambulance service but i'm not quite sure out of out of how many so thanks of oh, nine responses there so thank you everybody for uh, responding should we go on to the next one and in what setting do you work So thanks everyone mainly community and that's good because that's where we were targeting the webinars but i suppose um there are some people who will work in specialist palliative care in the community and you can't tick both boxes so that might be slightly slightly confusing there and we've got uh, people joining us from nursing homes and from secondary care which is great thank you okay thanks very much Bear with us, we're learning to use polls in Teams because we've done all our webinars via Zoom until the last series. So thanks, guys. OK, I think I'm going to stop sharing this slide and hand over to Elaine McLeish then to talk to us about nausea and vomiting. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Um, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, I'm going to talk today about nausea and vomiting, which is is not a very pleasant symptom in palliative care, um, and it's it's really quite distressing for sufferers as well, and it's a common symptom in patients in palliative care, affecting up to about 20, seventy percent of people with advanced cancer, and it causes huge distress. And and another thing to think about in palliative care. Um, these patients with advanced cancer, it's often multifactorial, so it can be quite difficult to treat the nausea and vomiting. So first of all, let's have a look at what nausea and vomiting is. So I've got some definitions here, which is probably quite obvious to most people what it is because it's quite a visible symptom. Nausea, probably not so much so. It's a sensation of a desire to vomit, and sometimes that can be as much it's much just causes much distress as vomiting um, the vomiting is the action of expelling gastrointestinal contents and it's usually an involuntary reflex and then you've also got retching as well um, where some people kind of retching but don't actually vomit any contents and that can be quite distressing and it can cause a bit of pain as well when patients are retching so what is our common causes of nausea and vomiting? So I've listed a few here. Um, gastrointestinal, which is a cause that a lot of people think about, whereas there's um, the stomach's 
stomach's full and the contents are not moving anywhere so it's causing gastrostasis gastric stasis so when the stomach's full and it's not going anywhere then there's a need to expel the contents and that causes vomiting some of the drugs that we use actually cause nausea and sometimes vomiting so it's things like opioids antibiotics um, NSAIDs, iron, digoxin. Then we've got our metabolic conditions. So things like hypercalcemia and renal failure. And then you've got your toxic causes. So very often patients with radiotherapy or chemotherapy um, have nausea and vomiting. And very often and, um, antiemetics are prescribed alongside these treatments. And infections, another one, um, which we don't always think about. Um, as a cause of nausea and vomiting. Patients with brain tumours or brain metastases um, and sometimes psychosomatic factors, things like anxiety and fear. Um, some patients can, can be anxious and then relate to nausea and vomiting, which can make it worse. And pain can be another cause. Some patients can be in so much pain or distress that they feel actually feel sick. So I've got some steps to could management um, for nausea and vomiting, and I'll go through these each one by one in different slides. So first of all, I think the, the obvious thing is carrying out a thorough assessment. It's just like every symptom that we have. If you carry out a thorough assessment and look at everything, which we'll talk about later, then you can manage it a bit better. Then we determine what neurotransmitters are involved. Then we choose an antiemetic for the specific neurotransmitter. Choose the relevant route of administration. So there's no point in giving somebody tablets if they're vomiting them back orally. We might need to think about injections or a syringe driver. Then obviously we reassess um, and look at any additional tr triggers um, and then look at any triggers that can be reversed. And then a plan of how to maintain and control the nausea and vomiting. So first of all, looking at the assessment. So when you take a history, so look at the time the patient has, has feeling nauseated or vomiting. Look for obvious triggers. So things like some people feel full um, after food and vomit straight after food. So that would suggest that there's some gastric stasis. So the, the food is not traveling al along the um, leaving the stomach, so that would, would influence the antiemetic that we use. And look at the content of the vomitus as well. So is it undigested food? Is it bile? Or is it feculent, which would suggest that it's coming from um, a bowel obstruction? Look at any investigations. So looking at um, maybe doing some bloods to look to see if the patient has got um, hypercalcemia or their renal function's okay, because we mentioned earlier about renal failure, patients can feel nauseated. Looking out their drug regime, so have they recently started some opioids? Um, and is that why they're feeling nauseated? Are they on antibiotics, which can make them feel um, nauseated as well? So just looking at through every single drug that the patient's on um, to see if there's anything related to that. And then the other thing is looking at associated symptoms. So have they got headaches? Have they got a brain tumour? So have they got headaches and raised intracranial pressure? So once we've done our assessment and we've found some triggers or reversible causes, it's important to treat them as well. So looking at their pain control, have they got severe pain? So do we need to review their analgesia? Have they got an infection, cough, hypercalcemia, tense ascites? Very often if patients have ascites, um, we need to treat the ascites, which can help with the nausea and the vomiting. Raised intracranial pressure. So we would think about steroids, which would reduce the, the raised intracranial pr pressure and reduce the inflammation. So are they on any any metagenic drugs. So these are drugs that cause vomiting. So we mentioned earlier about opioids. 
The other drugs that can cause vomiting are things like um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Antibiotics, do we need to review antibiotics? And then anxiety as well. If patients have anxiety related to nausea and vomiting, do we need to look at giving them some anti-anxiety medication as well? So once we've treated reversible causes, we want to find out if there's any drugs or medications that can help. And just looking at the pathophysiology of nausea and vomiting can help with the drug choice that we use. So, so basically this diagram, I'm not going to go into great detail with it, but there are multiple neurotransmitters involved in the neuroconduction pathways associated with nausea and vomiting. So just to put it simply, the vomiting centre is in the brainstem and it triggers the vomiting reflex. And the vomiting centre has input from the thoroabdominal, thoroabdominal organs, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the vestibular system and higher cerebral cortex. And this lies within the brainstem, partly outside the blood brain barrier and receives input both from the circulation, so that's drugs and toxins, and from multiple neuroendocrine pathways. So when we're looking at drugs of choice, antiemetics work by binding to specific receptor sites at chemoreceptor trigger zones or the vomiting centre in the brain. And at each site, there's several receptors, and the more strongly the drug binds to its receptor, the more potent its antiemetic activity is. So we've got quite a few different types of drugs. So we've got antiemetics. So these are drugs that block the emetogenic reflex in the brainstem. So we've got drugs that to promote peristalsis in the upper gastrointestinal tract, and these are called prokinetics. And then we've got drugs to reduce the volume of gastrointestinal secretions, and these are anti-secretory agents. And then you've got your adjuvant drugs, for example, corticosteroids, which I mentioned earlier to reduce inflammation. If, if somebody's got raised intracranial pre, um, pressure. I find this um, chart really helpful because it lists a lot of the common antiemetics that we use with the, the receptor sites. And sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, um, in palliative care, it can be multifactorial, the, the nausea and vomiting, and sometimes you need to use a combination of different drugs. So, if you know what receptors they hit, then it can influence your choice of drugs. So for example, um, if you can see cyclozine hits two receptors, and if you add in some haloperidol, then you're hitting three receptors as well. There is a drug, levomepromazine, and I've been at previous teaching sessions on nausea and vomiting, and it's been called the domestus of antiemetics because it hits all the receptors. But the only difficulty with levomepromazine is it's anti, it, it can be sedate, sedative. So we don't often use it for patients routinely if we don't want to make them drowsy. So just going into these drugs in a bit more detail. Um, they can be grouped into different categories. Um, but bearing in mind there's side effects and interactions from each drugs. I won't go through all of these because you can see the chart in front of you with the different drugs. But I just wanted to talk about some different side effects and, in and interactions for each drugs. So some of the drugs can cause extra pyramidal effects. So that's like things that can um, cause tremors. Um, and we need, to, we need to avoid them in Parkinson's. So drugs like metoclopramide and haloperidol, these cross the blood-brain barrier and we shouldn't use them in patients with Parkinson's. There's drugs that have got an anticholinergic effect, so they can cause a dry mouth and constipation. And these are things like cyclozine. And we've got to be aware of using prokinetics if patients have got colic. So 
metoclopramide is a prokinetic, so we have to be aware of using that with patients that have got colic because it can make their colic worse. As I mentioned earlier, levomipromazine, it's a broad spectrum antiemetic, but it's very sedating. So it tends not to be the first drug of choice, but if patients are deteriorating and they're approaching end of life and we want that sedation effect, then we can use that as well, that, use that at that time. You've got drugs like 5-HT3 antagonists, so that's drugs like ondansetrone, which are very good when used for chemotherapy in post-op, but they're very constipating as well. So we have to bear that in mind when we're, we're looking at antiemetics as well. Um, and there's drugs that, that can cause acute prolongation, um, and these are things like domperidone and ondansetrone. Domperidone would be the drug of choice if you wanted a prokinetic for somebody with Parkinson's because it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. And another caution as well is not to use metoclopramide and cyclozine together because they don't work together, they just cancel each other out. Wouldn't cause any harm, but it wouldn't be any point in using them together. Sometimes you, you see people at home and they have a bag of all different types of drugs. So it's going through these medications and just making sure that they don't take these two drugs together. So just to summarise then with um, nausea and vomiting, identify, identify any causes that can best be treated specifically and choose the antiemetic based on the most likely cause of nausea and vomiting. So that's always down to your, your accurate assessments. Always give antiemetics regularly, not on a PRN basis. And as I mentioned earlier, if, if vomiting is preventing drug absorption, use an alternative route like a syringe driver. The other thing to think about is um, mouth care is really vital if somebody is vomiting, um, is, is giving them good some oral, oral hygiene care and looking at their mouth as well. Monitor blood regularly just to check if somebody's had hypercalcemia, do we need to monitor that on a regular basis? And obviously, like any symptom we've got, we need to reassess just to make sure that the medication is working um, because it can change at any time and their symptoms can change at any time. Any questions? And I'm not sure if there's any questions in the chat as we've been going along, but... Um, there is the chat at the moment, Elaine. I have been uh, keeping an eye, but happy for people okay. to either unmute and speak or to put anything they would like to ask in the chat now. And we can um, ask as we go along. What would you say the most common anti sickness drugs you use are, Elaine? And I know it depends yeah, well, on what you think the cause is. Depends on their cause, but metoclopramide is always a, a common drugs to start with um, and obviously the assessment we do, we do first the assessment metoclopramide or cyclozine is another one and cy cyclozine we rut routinely prescribe for end of life care as one of the just in case medications. So James you've got your hand up do you want to ask a question? Um, do you, can I make a comment rather than a question? Oh, go on then. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, you know. I like to talk. Uh, so I'm James Davis. I'm a consultant with City Hospice. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for that, Elaine. I think that was a really good overview of um, of sort of nausea and vomiting, which is, I think, when when you see it in sort of written down, it, it's much more complicated than than you'd think, isn't it? Because I, you know, yeah. as, a, as an F1, I used to say, well, I'll give them cyclozine. If that doesn't work, I'll give them methylamide. Then on dance drum will kill her all. But actually, there's something quite um, quite satisfying about about actually trying to get it right. Just on a, on an anecdotal level, I, 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 you started using olanzapine more just because it is slightly broader than levomipramazine, but less sedating. And I have had a couple of patients where they've been on decent doses of levomipramazine in a driver and still nauseated, and a low dose of olanzapine has worked quite well. So I'm not saying it's sort of the, the, the cure-all, uh, and the problem with that is that they don't have, um, uh, you can't give it as a as a subcut. So at the end of life, you're not going to be able to use it. 
Um, the, only, the only other comment I had, I had to make is, is in terms of um, thinking about rationalizing anti-emetics uh, in the syringe driver, especially at the end of life. Things like if you're putting, if someone's on cyclazine and you're putting hyacine hydrobromide in and actually you're just putting, the cyclazine was just in there just in case, you can probably stop the cyclazine because you've got an anti-nausea drug being put in. Um, and things like, you know, if you're adding levomopromazine in for agitation, then you might possibly be able to stop the other ones. Not saying always stop it, but sometimes you can you can sort of do without. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my um, that was my my bit. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thanks, James. Yeah, I never spoke about olanzapine because it's not a routine antiemetic that we usually think of first off. But yeah, thanks for adding that. And it is useful drug. And I think that parts of the world that don't have cyclazine tend to, tend to substitute olanzapine where you would use cyclazine. So it is something that we can use, but um, it has to be oral or, or sort of the bling, um, you know, melt, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any other questions, comments, concerns? we could move on otherwise because we've got quite a lot of pain stuff to get through I just just one comment from me um lots of you may know that if patients have got things like Parkinson's disease you have to be a little bit careful what anti-sickness medicines you give them and hopefully Elaine's presentation has helped for anybody that didn't quite know why um so if she showed you that that dopamine receptors are important in some of the nausea and vomiting pathways and and you know that Parkinson's disease is a sort of um, a lack of dopamine in your system. And so you don't want to block any more dopamine or you might make your Parkinson's disease worse. So therefore, we tend to avoid medicines like metoclopramide and haloperidol for Parkinson's disease patients and probably start off with things like cyclozine or domperidone. That's just for people to know. Thank you. OK, I think it's probably best then. Thank you very much, Elaine. That was really helpful. You can continue to put comments or questions in the chat as we go along. But I think we'll now hand over to Kat Seed from City Hospice and the Specialist Palliative Care Community team from the City of Cardiff, who's going to talk about pain control. Over to you, Kat. Thank you very much, Joe. Hi, my name's Catriona. I'm one of the nurses from City Hospice. I've got Dr James Davis with me as well, one of our consultants. So we just want to have a chat with you about pain, if we could get... Apologies, this, this, is, this is my um, my technological um, slowness. Hopefully it should be coming up now. Can you let me know, Joe? can you see the presentation? We can see it, yes, James. Yes. Lovely, great. Brilliant. Okay, okay. okay. So we'd like to have a chat with you about pain, um, about what the definition of pain is, the mechanisms behind it, how you assess and treat pain. And then we'll go through a few other key points and then there'll just be a little case study to wrap things up. If you do have questions, then do feel free to put something in the chat. Um, we can always discuss it as we go through. Lovely. So. To start up with, does anyone have any idea about what pain is? Can anyone give us a definition? And don't be afraid to speak up. I, I would have, I, I would have probably put a rubbish definition in. Um, I, I think it's a harder. Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of hard. It's a, it's a harder thing than you, than you'd think, isn't yeah. it? So, is, is anybody brave enough to put up their hand or put it in the chat what they would define as pain? Absolutely. Pain is very subjective. Yes. <laughs> Pain is what the patient tells you it is. That's an unpleasant experience. Yeah. You guys have all been cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's really important to what one of you said. Pain is what the person says it is. OK, so it's really important just to always have that in the back of your mind. Um, I hope some of you are aware of this. I appreciate it's quite a small diagram here, uh, but pain, as you say, is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience and it's complex. So there's lots of different aspects that affect our sensation of pain. So Cicely Saunders, Dame Cicely Saunders, I should say, came up with the concept of total pain and it looked at not just the physical aspect of pain, but looking at social elements, 
um, psychosocial um, people's anxiety can make pain worse. If they're worried about loved ones or if they're worried about their housing situation, that can make sensations of pain worse. So it's really important when you're doing any pain assessments that you're looking at the whole person and not just assessing the physical aspect of the pain. Did you have anything else? No, 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 that? I think that's a pretty good uh, pain is, is you know, same as same as nausea and vomiting. It's not straightforward. And I think it's not just a, you know, we're doing these as physical symptoms on their own. But the, all of these, the uh, as Kat has said, then your emotional state is going to make pain worse, but also pain may have an impact on how you function as a person and what your role is. Uh, you know, work your you know may have a massive impact on on your on your life. So it's it's thinking about we're going to go through assessment and and medications and things, but actually a lot of it is around you know when i see patients in clinic who are in pain and we've got the ot coming in and the welfare rights office actually what they do is just as important if not more yeah. important um so yeah so, so it's important just to keep that that's probably a really important uh slide or, or concept just yeah. to have in in your in your minds so pain is a symptom it's not a diagnosis so we need to sit down with the person and find out what is causing the pain Okay, so in 70% of our patients that have a cancer diagnosis will have pain. Uh, I think a lot of people expect it to be much higher, but it's usually around 70%. But our patients with a non-malignant diagnosis, um, around 65% of those will have pain and it'll be for all sorts of reasons. So you could have someone with COPD, um, but they will have other diagnoses going on that may cause pain. Around 66% of people will have more than one source of pain. And the severity of pain was, is likely to dictate what medications we're going to be using and the doses. Uh, patho pathophysiology, I can't speak now, will determine if we need additional medication and we'll come on to that in a little bit. Is everyone OK with that? Under a silence, I shall continue. <laughs> Please feel free to put anything into the chat if you do want to add anything in. OK, so there are several mechanisms um, that will affect um, how we experience pain. So you've got the I can never say that top word. Go on. No, sir. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you've got where the uh, pain receptors are communicating from either the skin, the bone or the tissues, which is somatic pain, or you've got visceral where it's usually involved in the organs. And you can usually tell that pain by the description. So when you're doing a pain assessment, that will give you information as to where the pain's coming from. You get neuropathic, which is where the pain is obviously impacted by the nerves. And you get functional. And functional is going back to what James is saying. So there may pain can be increased or pain can be caused by these other factors that are outside of the physical body, such as needing OT assessments, stresses outside of the home, their actual personhood being affected. OK, um, it's really important when we're doing these assessments that we're identifying the mechanism of the pain because it will affect what types of medications that we're using and what we're going to do with the management. OK. Anything else to add? No, I think the only thing I'd say is somatic. I mean, the way I see it in a really, in a really simple way is somatic is very localized so you've got you know if i broke my arm that would be somatic mm. i can point to it visceral classically you've got you know your heart attack would be a visceral so it's your heart and it's not you know it wouldn't necessarily be painful you can't feel your heart in pain but you may feel it somewhere else and then neuropathic classically something like sciatica is a neuropathic mm. type pain just to get it in your mind when we're talking about the different types because it it sounds academic, but it does make a difference to what you do pain wise yeah. and what what pains are going to respond to to different measures. Yeah. Right. Hold on a second. I can't see. Oh, can I, I go up there? The ah, lovely. Go on. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so first off, when we're doing a pain assessment, we need a good history. OK, if you're somebody who has access to imagery, that is great. But sitting down with the person and taking a good history is really important. There's a, there's a couple of different scales there. So you've got your typical numerical rating scale, the NRS, which you're not to 10. So asking people if they can score their pain. You sometimes have the visual um, 
analog scale. So you can see the, the happy little faces there. Oh, not so happy. <laughs> okay. One of the things as well, I don't know if Charlotte's able to share um, a, a, a slide I showed her earlier. There's a pain assessment tool that the doctors will often use, but it's really good to have in your head sometimes, and that's called the Socrates so method. And I'm doing my impression of Bill and Ted there. Um, so it's using this acronym. Thank you, thank you, Charlotte. So it's thinking when you're taking the history of the patient, where the pain is. So can they point exactly to an area? What causes the pain? So are they doing anything when the pain started at the arrest? Is it on certain activities? Can they describe it? And a lot of people do struggle to describe pain. And it's very hard to kind of, we almost give leading questions, don't we, when we're trying to encourage people to describe their pain. Uh, but if they can give certain words like stabbing pain, shooting pain, burning pain, those words will help us identify potentially the mechanism behind that. Does the pain radiate? So is it moving anywhere else? Is it starting in the chest and radiating to the back or in the back and going down the leg? Do they get, as Elaine said, do they, do they have so much pain that it's making them feel nauseated? So is there something else that we need to help manage there? How long does the pain last for? How long have they had it for? Um, are there any other exacerbating causes or is there anything that makes it feel better, makes it feel worse? And then severity. So can they give a, a pain score? And if they're already on medications and they're taking something like all morph to manage pain, how effective, how does it impact when they're taking it? So if they, does the pain score come down and what does it come down by? So all of that information is really helpful. Thank you, Charlotte. Hold on. No. It's two seconds, so I'm just going to get the. Get the clock back up. We only just learned to do this today, so I'm quite impressed that it's. Uh, well, I say that we need to actually get it back up first. There we go, and we'll get it to the right slide. All right, can you see that again? Eight, I think we're at. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, yeah there we lovely. go. OK, so not receptive pain. <laughs> so um, somatic pain, as James described, it's usually very well localised. So like you gave the example, is it a broken arm? Is there a sh people often describe it as a sharp pain, as an ache, um, whereas visceral, which is often more sort of located in the organs, people find it hard to define exactly where it is. I can often describe it as cramping pain. It sometimes feels almost like pressure. Mm. Sometimes it's a word that can get used. If you do have access to scans, and that will probably give you a clue. And certainly in a lot of our patients, it's probably related to tumours. And that will give us information as well. Okay. Neuropathic pain. So this is um, the neuropathic pain uh, assessment tool that was um, put together to help us identify neuropathic pain and assess it. It's a bit tiny there. Hopefully you can see it a bit better on the, the bigger screen there. Um, you may not need to use it all the time with all of your patients, but it's really useful to know that that tool is out there. I think it's just to say that it's not, you're not going to get a, yeah, uh, we wouldn't be expecting you to score this on people routinely, but some of the things on there are just useful little hints towards this being a neuropathic type pain. Things mm. like on there is is how they describe it is the sensation sort of prickling, burning. Um, is there, is there altered sensation? So sometimes with neuropathic pain, you can get something that doesn't normally cause pain that causes a, a significant amount. So, you know, sometimes you'll see patients with their bed clothes or, so, or something has mm. moved across them and that causes pain or something that does cause pain, but it's it's almost out of proportion with what has actually happened. So don't worry too much about the index of that scale, but it just gives you a bit of a, a bit of a flavour as to what things would point towards this being a neuropathic type pain. OK. No, no come on. <laughs> so typical causes of neuropathic pain is going to be a direct compression of the nerve by a tumour. 
Um, there's a complication of cancer called malignant spinal cord compression, which happens to about 10% of people with a cancer diagnosis where there's um, tumour in the bone, in the spine. It's something that is a palliative care emergency. So if you're seeing anyone with a neuroacute pain in their, in their back, if it's causing changes in sensation in their legs, um, if it's causing incontinence, both bladder and bowel, you know, you need to get hold of either Valindra or GP urgently and get an emergency reviewed. Sometimes neuropathic pain can be a side effect of treatment. Um, it could be a side effect of radiotherapy or surgical treatment, um, even sometimes chemotherapy. So mm. you'll often get things like uh, chemotherapy neuropathy, um, where the chemotherapy has damaged the nerves and then they end up with pain from that. You can also get diabetic neuropathy as well, and it's a similar mechanism, to be honest with that as well. Post-hepatic pain um, and quite often functional pain can often present as neuropathic. Mm. Yeah, there's, lot, there's lots of lots of different causes yeah. and often there's more than one. <laughs> yes. Mm. So how are we going to treat it? So when we're doing our assessment, we're looking at what the mechanism is and that's going to guide it. Do we need to do any further investigations to identify what's going on? Do we need any further scans or any other blood tests to identify what's going on? We need to sit down with patients and they need to understand the logic of what's going on with them as well, because the more they understand, the more they can take control back over what's going on. Um, Ideally, we want to treat the underlying cause of the pain, but that will not always be possible. So if we have a tumour, and especially in palliative care, the likelihood is we are not going to get, be able to get rid of that tumour. We may be able to liaise with Valenjo and help with reduction of it, but we're probably not going to get rid of it. So it's managing people's expectations of that, and it's using the medications. And we always like the least amount that will achieve the best for the patient. So we always want to be starting low and then building up on that. It's really important as well that we don't forget our non-pharmacological approaches. There can be often a very big focus on medications, but actually um, things like using hot or cold pads, using things like the TENS machines, so they're the transdermal electrical impulse machines that can often be very helpful. Things like hypnotherapy, relaxation therapy, um, we sometimes um, complementary therapies such as reflexology can really help. Distraction, um, setting goals and helping people to manage their expectations can be really helpful. And sometimes counselling. So again, it's looking at that total pain and looking at all the different aspects. Again, do we need to get their benefits reviewed? Do we need to make sure that our housing situation is secure? Do we need to get our specialists in to sort out a free will for people and give people the security from the other side of things so that they're not worried about things? So it's really important that we consider the whole person and not just the pain. And then obviously the medications. Okay. So principles of analgesia. So first line, we will always try orally. Obviously, there are alternative routes available. So we've got transdermal patches that you usually see. We can obviously give injections that usually just subcutaneously or we can give rectally. So do we need when we're giving these medications, do we need to give them regularly? Do we need to consider if someone's taking a certain amount of oral for every day? Do we need to convert them to a long acting tablet that we give regularly? We set times and then they can have as needed medication as they need it. And obviously we do follow the WHO analgesic ladder, okay, and that helps to guide how we titrate up our medications. So, as I said before, we start low, we go slow, and especially in the community as well, because obviously we can't monitor them as closely as say perhaps they can in Mary Curie Hospice or in the hospitals and we don't have someone there 24-7. So we'll always start with the lowest dose and then build up. And I think it's very important to make people aware that we may start in a suboptimal dose. So we may have to start low and it may not help. And that's OK. It's getting people's confidence. It's better to start low than start with too high a dose. 
people get unpleasant side effects and it puts them off and then they will never try that medication again. And you do see that sometimes, especially with things like hormone phenoxycodone. So it's really important to build people's trust and confidence with the medication. We really must make sure that we're reviewing the medications regularly, making sure that they're effective and make sure that people understand how to use them and when to use them. And I always encourage my patients to do a pain diary, so writing down when they're taking the medications. And ideally, if they can write, they've been effective and write a pain score, that's even better. It doesn't always happen, but writing down times gives us really valuable information when we're then assessing the pain relief. Really important, we make sure that we're collecting information on allergies so we're not giving medications um, that may be inappropriate. And we also need to make sure that we're making sure that there's no inappropriate drug interactions. OK. And then again, like say, by the ladder, so the few allergies at ladder. Thank you, James. <laughs> so here's the Hue Analgesic Adder. It's been updated again. I'm not sure if we've got the 2022 version there, uh, but it has been updated. Not huge. I don't think there's massive changes yeah. on it. I think it's gone out of vogue a bit, but yeah. for me, I think it's a good place to start. I mean, you can't you can't write something that's going to cover every single patient. No. So it's just it's just good principles to follow, I think. Yeah. And I think it's always starting with one. If you've got a new pain, it's quite a mild pain, then you should always be starting with your paracetamol unless it's contraindicated. And then consider your things like your NSAID, so your ibuprofen, things like that, and any potential adjuvants. OK, your step two is looking at your weak opioid on top of these medications such as your codeine, dihydrocodone and tramadol. But quite often we see a skip from step one to step three. And I think a lot of the time that is quite appropriate, especially when we're starting a low dose OMOF. So your step three is your strong opioid, so that's like OMOF and oxycodone. One of the benefits is when you're using the liquids, obviously we can titrate, titrate the dose much more effectively and we avoid some of the other side effects. I often find personally codeine is far more constipating than Oromorph. So if I think actually someone needs an opioid, I will often start with a low dose Oromorph and build up the dose rather than playing around with codeine. I often find some much simpler way around skipping that step. But that step is there and sometimes you may find that actually codeine is will work for them and that will be really effective. I think the skip is particularly in in cancer related pain where yeah. you know if things are going to progress you're you're invariably going to end up on on step three anyway yeah. so you may as well just not bother with step two but but it but it's horses for courses i think everybody would do something or i don't say everybody but if you ask 10 palliative care um doctors and nurses what they would do you may get 10 different answers and all those answers are hopefully in some way right yeah. um so yeah so this is just a general kind of uh framework to work from not to say you have to do it in yeah. a certain way i think it's important as well for patients especially as ones that can be quite anxious about moving on to morphine and have been on codeine that codeine is actually broken down by the body into morphine and when you describe that to patients, often the ones that are anxious about moving on to the morphine can feel a little bit more reassured. And um, so that's just sometimes that can be quite helpful. So strong opioids, so morphine is our first line. It is the gold standard uh, in care. So normally we would use the oral morph immediate release. It does come in tablet form as well, which is cephalodol. There's not a great range in the the strengths of Sephardol that we've got. There is another one as well that's not that's recently come out, Actomorph, yeah. which I think is an all dispersible tablet, isn't it? And it's got the ranges which are much more credible to the doses we use in palliative care of the Ormorph. We'll probably see it more used more often, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really helpful for those patients who maybe can't measure out Ormorph safely, either because they haven't got the dexterity to open the bottle or measure measure it. So I am I think that's quite a good thing that mm. that's come out. Um, modified release, so we've got 12 hourly tablets, so they do need to be taken regularly. So that's your morphine sulfate tablet MST, and you've also got Zomorph. The benefit to Zomorph is it's capsules, you can open them up 
and you can pop them through a peg or if you've got someone who can't swallow the tablet you can pop it on a little bit of yogurt if people are still swallowing and it is perfectly safe because the granules are slow release so if you've got someone who's struggling to swallow um, and finds the MST too much then that is always an option as well which is really quite helpful Morphine does have a subcutaneous injection, so it comes in injectable ampules, and you've got lots of ranges of there. And we usually start our pain doses to between two and a half milligrams to five milligrams, and we'd normally recommend that up to two to four hourly. It does go on your patient history, so have a look at them. If someone's maybe opioid naive, maybe quite frail, quite elderly, I would definitely be starting on the the smaller age. If I've got someone who's relatively young in their thirties or forties, no particular other history, I'd probably start them on the five milligrams. But again, you're looking at that whole person um, and making your decision based on that. And then you would obviously review and you would titrate as they tolerate it. OK, and again, that's where your pain diary comes in really handy. So the other medication that we also use is oxycodone. So it is theoretically working the same as Ormorf, it just affects different receptors. So when someone is not able to tolerate morphine, so say if they've got side effects that um, mean that they can't manage morphine, we can use oxycodone. It's also much better tolerated if someone's got impaired renal function. Um, so again, it comes in similar um, similar um, liquids and tablets. You've got your oral solution. So that's often called short tecooxinol. Um, you've got your immediate release tablets as well, which is short tec or again oxinol. And you've got your modified release tablets. So that's things like your ox, long tec and oxycontin. Thing to be aware of the oxycodone, just to bear in mind that it is twice as strong as morphine. So if you are converting someone over for morphine to oxycodone, you do need to bear that in mind. I think there's a, there's a comment in there um, from Nikita just saying um, it's worth mentioning that doctors who prescribe one dose and avoid putting in parameters. Uh, ideally, yes, you shouldn't. You, I mean, de it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll advise patients to take, you know, they may have one mm -hmm. dose or another dose, but I think in terms of uh, when I'm prescribing on a drug chart, I would prescribe a certain dose. Um, I think that's fair to say, not just doctors, that's that's mm -hmm. any prescribers. So I'm, <laughs> I'm being defensive there. Um, and uh, yeah, so hopefully that, that's answered your question. The other, th the other thing that was in there is, I wonder the other one, Joe, I think will probably answer at the end because it's quite general. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just put it in for us at the end there. Lovely, great. Someone's very happy with the response. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, so transdermal patches. So we've got a couple of options out there. We've got buprenorphine, which you usually see as a butrans patch or a really trans patch, or you've got fentanyl patches. So buprenorphine um, is equivalent to about 10 milligrams of morphine. Yeah, five, so a five microgram yeah. patch would be would be the same as yes, probably about yeah. twelve times twelve. Although yeah. although there's a the, these are all we'll come on to talk about it in yeah. terms of conversions, but they are they're just guides. Yeah. So for someone, say for example, that you've got who lives alone, they're in looked after in a hospital bed. You haven't got someone there that can give regular medication. They've got a pain that would be appropriate for a small amount of morphine, you may consider something like a patch. Fentanyl, you do need to be on a much higher dose of morphine before you consider putting a fentanyl patch in. Fentanyl patches are changed every three days, buprenorphine patches are changed every seven days, and ideally you need the pain to be well controlled and stable. You need to understand how much pain relief they're needing because of the way that they're absorbed by the skin. They you can't have rapid changes. They take a little while to build up to the optimal dose. And if unfortunately, if someone becomes toxic with them, they're not going to be quick to get out of the system. And if they're home alone, we could be putting them in an unsafe place. They can sometimes be better options if someone's got renal failure as well, or if they're struggling with swallowing. So that's quite useful. And again, as always, we start low and we go slow. And obviously check guidance for extra information there, but they can be a really helpful option. 
So just checking in. Um, there's another one on there as well that we don't use very often in the community because they are expensive, but we do sometimes for more localised pain and it would only be beneficial for localised pain is things like your lidocaine patches. Mm -hmm. So if someone say got a pathological fracture or something like that and the pain relief was struggling to get on top of it, sometimes just a lidocaine patch directly over the site of pain can be helpful. Um, you must remember though it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off because otherwise the skin doesn't get enough rest and it stops absorbing the medication effectively. The only thing to say on lidocaine patches is uh, sometimes because they're expensive it's important yeah. that if you do it and, and it, it's only licensed for very certain things when we often we use we use a, a lot of our drugs we use off license mm -hmm. which is fine uh, as long as we're ex experiencing using it but is to go back and review it because um yeah, they are expensive yeah. and, and sometimes it can be uh you know gps can be told off when they look when they looked at their prescribing um uh sort of over over six months over three yeah. months however long if there's too many certain drugs so sometimes they'll get told off so if a gp saying oh i don't know sometimes it's because they're getting told off by someone else not just because they're being yeah, awkward course. i don't say not just <laughs> yeah. they're not being awkward um but yeah definitely an option yeah. for some people it works very well yeah I think always consider your other options first, but it is sometimes something that you can be helpful. Fentanyl. So fentanyl is, I forget the conversion of fentanyl, it's a much stronger than morphine and um, oxycodone. We've got lots of different options with fentanyl, but it's got quite a short half-life, so it's um, cleared by the body very quickly. So sublingual tablets, the Abstra and the Ephentora, they're used particularly for things like what we would call instant pain. So that's pain where, say, for example, you're giving them care in the bed and they've got pain from a hip fracture. Giving it to them 10 minutes before the, the movement would help with that pain over the movement. But it's usually cleared within 30 minutes, hour yeah. tops. So it's a very quick acting. You've got intranasal as well. Um, so that's another method of administration of that. Um, it can sometimes be given mucosally. So you've got transdermal patches, as I said, good for the instant pain. Um, again, you do you should be on at least 60 milligrams of morphine in a day before we, we should be considering these really, because they are much stronger. Um, and it's not as easy, it's not as straightforward, is it, when we're titrating and dosing the fentanyl products yeah. in comparison to your, your morphines. What we tend to use is Abstral, um, and it's only licensed up to four times a day. Um, and, you know, sometimes we do use it for patients where they're less than 60 milligrams of morphine, but that's a conscious, that's then a conscious decision yeah. to say, yes, we're going off license again. So it's not something that I would be expecting non-specialists, yeah. people outside of palliative care to necessarily think about or prescribe, but I think it's just useful to know it's there and what it's used yeah. for. Yeah. So this is a very tiny chart and I can't see it there. <laughs> but so this is looking at opioid dose conversions. So it is really helpful to have something like this. And you find copies of this in a lot of the guidelines. Uh, but generally speaking, your morphine is oral compared to your subcut. So your subcut will be twice as strong as your oral. When you're looking at oxycodone, oxycodone is twice as strong as morphine. The subcut is twice as strong as the all. So they're quite easy conversions. They're quite nice and helpful. Back in the days when we used to use diamorphine more regularly, that was a third. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I think that table just high, high, more to highlight. I don't expect you to remember or know the, the exact conversions, but it's just they're not like for like. And if you're not doing it all the time and even, you know, some of them I'll I'll work it out in my head and then go and check it on a calculator yeah. just to be on the safe side, especially if you're talking, you know, going from oral oxycodone to subcut, um, uh, sorry, oral morphine to subcut oxycodone. So you're going through a, th a few steps. So it's more just to highlight they aren't the same and just make sure you, you know, that the doses are the correct doses mm. if you are converting someone from, from one opioid to another. Another thing to bear in mind as well, if you're converting, say, someone from morphine to oxycodone, we won't always go for the straight conversion. What we'll normally do is go a little bit under 
under the dose. So if you've got someone, say, on 30 milligrams of morphine over 24 hours and we're changing the toxicodone, according to that chart, that would be 15 milligrams in 24 hours. And we probably put that as 10. So bringing that down a little bit because we don't know how that person's going to respond to that new medication and putting them on exactly the same level. Potentially, we could see someone showing signs of toxicity. So it's always a good idea if you're converting someone across to go under the then converted dose and then you can always titrate up. And again, it's talking patients through that and understanding the rationale for that. So when we're considering our strong opioids, remember your ABCs, OK? So A is for antiemetic, as Elaine's already gone through for us. So as she said, strong pain relief often causes nausea and vomiting. So making sure you've got an antiemetic in. And in the community, we generally use cyclosine or metoclopramide for our first line. But when you're doing the, the patient history, hopefully you'll know which one you want to go for from that. B is for breakthrough analgesia. So when we look at someone's 24 hour dose of a strong morphine, so morphine or oxycodone, we want to look at that 24 hour dose and then we divide it by six and that will give us what their breakthrough dose will be. OK, and obviously if we're changing and we're reviewing their background medication, so the MSTs, the Zomorphs, the long text, then we need to look back at their breakthrough dose and change that appropriately. OK, so they're always in line with each other. And then C is for constipation. So unfortunately, opioids uh, can be great pain relief, but they do slow the bowels down. So it's making sure that people have access to a regular laxative and explain to them that we want a nice soft stool that's easy to pass as my little bench for my patients. So making sure that they're keeping an eye on their bowels and make sure they're taking the medication so they're not suffering them from constipation. So as I just said, we talked about, we mentioned breakthrough pain. So what we describe breakthrough pain is as a moderate to severe pain on the background of a well-controlled pain. It wasn't well-controlled because they've now had a breakthrough. Okay. So they're probably on a long-acting pain relief like your MSTs, like your, Oxy your Oxycontins, and they've got pain on top. That could be instant pain, as I've mentioned before. So is that pain on movement because they've got a hip fracture? If they got pleura pain, so they've when they're breathing, there's damage to the lungs and that's causing pain. Some people, especially people with our esophageal um, cancers, can have pain on swallowing. Do they have pain on dressing changes? So these are what we would call the instant pains. And this is where sometimes they're predictable. So if we've got someone who has pain on swallowing and they're about to have a meal, I might suggest taking a little bit of Olmorph or Oxycodone before their meal so that we're helping with that pain. If they're having pain on dressing changes or if they're going to have pain when they're being moved in personal care, again, we may want to speak to them about taking some pain relief before the incident so that their pain will then be better controlled. And then we've got the periodic pain. So that's often caused by what we call end of dose failure. So if, say, for example, someone's taken a long acting pain relief, should be lasting 12 hours and it's only after 10 hours their pain is coming back. That says to me that their pain, their background pain relief is not at the appropriate level and we need to do an assessment. Probably what we need to do is look at the whole pain regime, probably need to tweak up the long acting, but they can use again the short acting to manage that in the short term. So really important we talk through how they use that short acting pain relief and again using the pain diary. So when we're reviewing this pain relief, we, we've got everything that we need. Okay. And I think just quickly, this this highlights that um, you can't always just add up how many PRN someone has had and, and add it to it and that's then how yeah. much you go up with your long acting. Because actually if you've got very good background pain control, but they're being more, this patient is being moved four times a day, so they're having four lots of oromorph in a day, but that's working. There's no need to touch the background pain control yeah. as long as it's working, it's working. Absolutely. Um, so we just highlighted it's not as simple as just often, just, just saying when they've had four lots of oromorph, yeah. we need to increase it because it's not going to make a difference to the incident pain. No, because they're still going to have the oromorph when they're moved. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. 
So some of the common adjuvant analgesia. So we do use medications alongside the strong opioids. They will have um, other um, they've helped that start again. They're helping other mechanisms and other pathways for pain transmission. So most of these are looking at things like your neuropathic pathways. So your things like your gabapentin, your pregabalin. Amitriptyline is sometimes used for um, your neuropathic pathways, but it can also help if people are struggling with secretions as well. And steroids. Steroids are a wonderful little drug. They help with nausea, they help with intracranial pressure, appetite, and of course they can help sometimes with pain. Um, particularly I find sometimes bony pain and liver capsular pain um, and headaches if they've got brain tumours, that could be really beneficial. And again, with any of these medications, we start low, we titrate up. With steroids, we try and avoid being on them long term if it's possible, because they come with their own caveat of side effects that usually get worse over time. OK. Um, and obviously, if there's a cause that can be treated through either radiotherapy, chemotherapy or surgery, then obviously it's reaching out to the relevant people and seeing if that's an option. Sometimes we can involve people from the pain clinics. So that's things like local injections, nerve blocks, things like that to try and help manage. And sometimes, as it says there, if it hurts and it moves, stop it moving. So do we need to immobilise the area? Is it a limb? Have they got a broken hip and we actually need to keep them bed bound and limit the movements that they've got to try and manage things? Did you want to add anything, no, James? No, no. So practical points to remember. So remember that we're treating this for the individual. OK, this is holistic person centred care. So it's making sure that this, this is for the person and not we're just doing this by rote. OK, if you're coming across someone and you're not sure you've come across, you're taking a patient history and you're seeing doses that you think don't seem appropriate or you've got any questions and, you know, reach out and speak to people, speak to your GP, speak to, you know, your palliative team or other members of your team. Um, and especially when you've got people on quite complex medication regimes and or if you're swipping over medications. Good communication is vital. OK, particularly for patients and relatives, they can have a lot of information overload when they when they're getting people involved with these things. So writing things down, make sure that you're able to answer any questions. If you don't know, go and speak to someone and come back to them. Sometimes when we get in these medication regimes, giving them a written drug chart can be really helpful so you can clearly see what they're doing and, and give them a goal and give them a regime that we can then go back and review. If we're approaching the end of life, then we're usually going to be managing these people's pain through subcutaneous medications. So that'd be the morphine or the oxycodone through injections or continuous infusion. So that's your syringe drivers. Um, and obviously, if someone's already on long term opioids, when we're setting up a syringe driver, we will need to replace those. So we won't be starting on those. The, the typical doses that we see at end of life will need to make sure that what's in the driver compares to what they've been needing orally, but also then their subcut medications as needed, the PRNs, also equate to these higher doses. OK, if there's a patch in place, as someone's on a driver, leave the patch on. Do not mess, <laughs> leave it in place. Um, and if you're having any problems, getting hold of any medication. So our palliative care pharmacies um, scattered around Cardiff. They are open on Saturdays and Sundays. And if you're unsure, contact your palliative care team. Okay. And then I think lastly, we just wanted to have a little chat through a case study and just see what people's thoughts are regarding it. I'm just conscious in terms of in terms of time, whether whether we whether we do the case study or not, Joe? So I think we can do the case study for people who would like to look at the case study because there's a sort of optional, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour for anyone that wants to stay on, ask us questions, discuss anonymised sort of patient stuff. And we won't record that bit or we go, or you could talk a little bit about the case study in that session. Um, but it's it's seven minutes past 
to now so anybody that does need to go um you know we we uh, realize that you're fitting this into work so don't worry um if you need to leave us if anybody would like to ask any questions or make comments please put them in the chat um and we can look at any of our questions that are in there and then talk a little bit about more the a little bit more about the case for anyone that wants to stay Kat and James is that all right yeah that's fine yeah um so can I ask a question is that okay <laughs> it's not going to be tricky well hopefully not I just wanted to I just wondered if you could maybe mention the names of some of the medicines that you haven't talked about in your talk because there's there's stuff that's quite specialised and that we might use from the specialist palliative care point of view, but that we wouldn't be expecting um, the, our colleagues out in the community, say GPs, district nurses, um, and those working in secondary care but not in palliative care to know very much about and wouldn't be expecting people that aren't specialists to be changing doses or making management decisions and would want them to come back to us with any queries but it might be just worth mentioning the names of some of those medicines that we sometimes use Kat and James if that's okay yeah absolutely there's a nice example one of my patients at the moment we've really struggled with quite complex pain and again he's got total pain um, but he's recently been started on methadone. Um, so he's on that twice a day at the moment. And that's a medication we don't use very often at all. Um, even my experience in palliative care, I've only used it a couple of times. And I certainly haven't used it recently. Um, it can be really helpful for, for complex pain, but it is something that's not um, seen very often. And it's also something that you need to have agreed with the GP because some GPs are not happy in prescribing mm. it as well. Um, and that's some, certainly something I would expect you to come back to the palliative team if you've got if you've got someone on that and you want to discuss that. Another one we do sometimes use is ketamine. Um, we But that will usually be in a, a syringe driver. And again, that's very complex, quite often complex neuropathic pain. Um, we do sometimes see that. But again, Mm. I've not used it very yeah. often myself. So. And the other, the other um, opioid sometimes you'll see is our fentanyl. Mm. Um, but being honest, I probably wouldn't usually start our fentanyl in the community or um, uh, because it's usually used in renal failure. Um, and yeah, so it's not something, but sometimes we'll see patients coming out of hospital with it. So it's just if you're if you're not sure, if you see a drug and you're not sure, just yeah. have a look in the BNF and see what it is um, and then speak to, you know, speak to someone if they're on, you know, if they're under part of care, they're not something like that, then then in all in all honesty, we, you know, that's sort of our specialist area. I, I would be expecting, no, I wouldn't be expecting the GPs to manage that yeah. on their own. Um, so, yeah, so those are ones which are less commonly used. But we do see, I think one of the main things that I do do teaching on, on most things in palliative care is actually if you do the simple things right, usually you don't have to do the 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 more sort of complex things, partly because, you know, looking at things like compliance. So actually half the time you prescribe these things and people aren't actually taking them more or they're not absorbing. Or, so yeah. usually if you if you do a minor tweak, that's usually enough. But sometimes like your patient, yeah. who I, I think I spoke to you about, Joe, and it's worked very well. The, um, the method and, and Joe kindly spoke to the GPs as well. I think yes, I did uh, the chat to the GP because they were a Remini GP and they don't know me. It went OK. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, they're good GPs the, there, Tracy. <laughs> and I mean, methadone you would usually see, obviously, in, in drug with uh, in opioids, um, uh, opioid uh, abstinence programs, wouldn't you? But it, um, mm. but yeah, so it is an opioid, but it works a little bit differently. It's a bit too complex to go into, but um but yeah, so those are the ones I was thinking, Joe. Anything yeah. else from your point of view? Um, weird and wonderful painkiller wise? No, I think the the message about anything weird and wonderful is to give us a call, ask us what yeah. it's for, ask us why we're using it, ask us if you were, you know, think something might need changing. Um, occasionally, octreotide we sometimes use, and that's a medicine that we sometimes use for patients who are obstructed or people who've got specific cancers, things that are known as net tumours, neuroendocrine tumours. Um, and I think you've listed the main things. There's another opioid that's called hydromorphone that we hardly ever mm -hmm. use, but exists out there. You went to Swansea, uh, you'd see it's used a lot in Swansea, actually. But I, but I think part it probably highlights the 
the importance of familiarity with things, isn't yeah. it? And and you become, you know, you become familiar, more confident in using something, then that's how you gain expertise in it. So if you're not sure, then you, rightly you would tend to be more cautious or ask for support. So yeah, that, that's the bottom line message in everything. I think um, if you're in Cardiff and Vale, give us a call and ask us for help if you're struggling with anything. And you will all, I know this these set webinars were sort of targeted towards Cardiff and Vale, but I'm sure that there are people who are from other health boards or other bits of uh, Wales or the NHS. Um, you, you will have your equivalent sort of palliative care teams wherever you work. So know how to contact them and, and contact them when needed. You're not supposed to know everything. Um, especially if you don't sort of work in this field all the time or you're not a specialist. Thank you. Right, let me check the chat. Um, OK, and there is a question there from someone who works in critical care and who, who wasn't able to join live and is just asking if um, the approach on the pharmacology side is the same. Um, I don't know if you want to pick that up, James, or do you want me to comment? I mean, I think the the drugs, the drugs are the drugs, aren't they? But yeah. it's um, but it's about number one is your route to an ITU. You're going to be using IV far more far more frequently, um, which is fine. You know, it, it's yeah. it's a, if you've got a line in and you you've got a route. Essentially, these medicines are a means to an end, aren't they? They're means to symptom control. I think because on ITU or in hospital or in hospice, and I think Kat had, had said it that you've got you've got eyes on someone 24 hours a day whereas in the community you've got you know the even if they've got carers going in you've got a maximum of four um you know sort of four care yeah. four calls a day and that is private care but four calls a day in general so you've got most of the day without someone else there so the the drugs are the same but how you use them will depend on there and it's back to that diagram depending on how their social setup is yeah. how frail they are so if you're worried that this is going to cause a side effect i'd almost go so low that i'm probably not even thinking it's going to work as a painkiller i want to make sure they're okay with it and then build it up to a point where where it's um uh, where it's them working the flip side to that i know we've said go uh, start low go slow which is absolutely what we should be doing somebody's clearly dying then actually, and we just need to get on top of their symptoms, then we are going to be more gung ho is the wrong word. But we're going to be well, our focus is the, yes, our focus is going to be consciously towards yeah. actually, well, we we haven't got the time to to titrate this. We need yeah. to try and get it right. Um so so yeah, so essentially, yeah, so the drugs drugs are the same, yeah. but how you use them will be impacted and the other thing is you know the you, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors and you know you've got you've got some very complicated social setups and things at times which mean that actually how how you use analgesia how you use any drug may be different um that's part of the fun but part of the of the stress of working in the community as well I think just to add in, so I've actually got intensive care experience. I worked at St George's in London for three years in ITU. Um, and I'll never forget when I was doing the intensive care module, someone gave the example of someone who had very complex pain that they could not get on top of with all of the morphine and all the other pain relief at all possible. And when they dug into the history, he'd had a car crash. He'd been leaving his wedding with his bride and his bride had died. This man had total pain and the total pain was not being addressed. Now you could say that's a difficult thing to try and manage in ITU as well, um, but the concepts are the same. You need to look at the person, you need to look at what's going on. You'll have people who are critically ill that come along with other diagnoses, but what has led to them going to ITU? When they, I know we try and avoid sedation now in ITU, so they're often there, they're quite frightened. They may be still intubated, but conscious and awake and we need to be supportive with them and guide them with that so the pharmacology is really important and again it'll be the same principles but we need to remember those non-pharmacological aspects as well uh, for people who are in ITU so it's just it is the same it will be the same concepts as well really and also I suppose that your patients may well be 
much less able to communicate and yeah. so you it's likely that you won't be able to ask them um what the pain feels like or whether the medicines have worked and we'll be relying on other things like you know whether they look restless or agitated yeah. or whether they've got a fast heart rate and that sort of stuff so the assessment yeah. might be slightly different yeah absolutely um, and probably worth on that um on that point joe just mentioning about you know patients say with with cognitive impairment who can't tell us um, just back to that assessment i mean ultimately the 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 goal is the same you want to find out what's causing the pain assess uh assess the pain you know the socrates mm -hmm. or whatever you use and then implement something and review the effect of that and get to a point where actually the pain is is a, at an acceptable level sometimes it's not getting rid of the pain sometimes it's making that acceptable in their day-to-day -day living if someone can't tell you these things because but a lot of what we rely on is what the patient is telling us you know one of the the things which is completely right was pain is what the patient says well what if the patient can't tell you yeah. um then we do use objective sort of uh validated scoring systems things like the abbey pain score in dementia the, there's something called the distat tool for um uh for people with learning difficulties um and it's i mean what well, they're not rocket science but they're really yeah. good um they're really useful tools for us and i think as well back to to reviewing things if you do something you've got an objective score before you've got an objective score afterwards you can then get a sense of actually is what you're doing working because the other thing to say is with these medicines there's no point throwing all these medicines at people if they're not doing anything so yeah. you know we try things uh, and a lot of what we do is there's no great evidence of one thing over another. Say those neuropathic agents we've spoken about, gabapentin, pregabalin, amethyptine. There's not really any great evidence of one over another. So it's important if it hasn't worked, then then change it because yeah. there's no point in 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 chucking more tablets down people. But sorry, back to my my original point was that um, that uh, yeah there there are scoring tools and assessments for people who can't actually tell us um, and I'm sure there's I'm sure there's ITU specific ones I'm not I, I don't work obviously so back in the day we used to use the Richmond agitation scale and things mm -hmm. like that so yeah so you will have an objective yeah. objective measure or something yeah else, that's right yeah. 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 yeah thank you do you want to stop sharing your screen because um, <laughs> I'm sure we have got too much time to go through the case study and just give people an opportunity to ask us questions or make comments and don't want to put anybody on the spot but there's some of my sort of nursing colleagues who are are listening in and helping out with the webinars um i don't know if anybody wants to say anything or to make any comments at all put them on the spot joe <laughs> i know <laughs> I was I said, one, of, one of them just came onto my screen, um, but uh, I think that was just an accident rather than wanting to speak. So, yeah. Yeah, Joe, we, would yeah, you like we are here, Lisa. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are here. Lisa's having trouble with her with her camera. Um, yeah, I think, and I think some people's internet playing up a little bit, isn't it? Joe, would you like me to stop recording now for this section? Yes, please. Sorry, Charlotte, I thought we had, but 